Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to my lecture number 21. And today we talk about the physics of wind power. Last lecture I explained you already the basics of wind power. And today I would like you to understand a bit more about the physics and technology of wind power. Those of you who are not a fiend to physics and they don't like formulas, I think they can still listen to this lecture because I try to explain everything in a way that everybody can follow it. And those of you who have some knowledge about physics, they can still watch this video and check if I do everything correctly. So last lecture I showed you this diagram here. It shows that with larger height the wind speed increases and that modern wind power stations are quite high because there they can get more power. So I showed you that the wind power goes with the third power of speed. And I would like to explain to you today why this is the case and what it means. So I use this wiggle between power and speed. This means that power is proportional to speed to the third power. This proportionality sign is not so much used nowadays, but I think it's very important because with that you can really learn the basics of physics much better. So what does it mean? If one quantity is proportional to another one, it means that if you double one, the other one is also doubled. And if you triple one, the other one is also tripled. If there's written speed to the third power, it means that you have to multiply speed three times with itself. So if you double the speed, then in this product where you have speed times speed times speed, there you have a factor of two and two and two, which means a total factor of 2 times 2 times 2 is equal 8. So that means if the speed of the wind is twice as big as before, then the wind power is 8 times as big, which is very important to know because that means the more wind you have, the more power you get, but not only in a linear fashion, but for the third power. So that means, for example, if your wind speed in some area is three times as big as in another area, you have to multiply 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. In this area, then the wind power is 27 times larger than in the other area. So that makes a big difference. So that is why it's so important to put the wind power stations in areas where there's a lot of wind. The other thing which was shown in the plot here is that the size of the rotators becomes bigger and bigger over the years. And the reason is that the bigger the blades are, the more wind power there is. And here we had the sentence, wind power increases with height and cross-sectional area. So it's not the radius of the blade, but it's a cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area goes quadratically with the radius, because you know the area of a circle is r times r times pi, pi is 3.14. And therefore, again, if you use this proportionality sign again, you can say power is proportional to speed to the third power, and power is proportional to the cross-sectional area of the blades. And the important thing about proportionalities is, is if a quantity is proportional to two things, like speed to the third and area, then it's also proportional to the product of the two. Yeah, so power is proportional to speed to the third power times the area. This is easy to understand because if you double the area, you double the power. And if you double the speed, you have eightfold the power. And if you double both, you have eight times two times the power. So that really shows you that the total dependency is proportional to the product of the two. And then there's an easy way to convert this proportionality sign into an equal sign. You just have to add a constant. This constant you also call the proportionality constant. And then you have the equation where you can really do a calculation with. The power is equal to a constant multiplied with the speed to the third power and multiplied with the radius to the second power. So that is the formula which you have to use to calculate the wind power depending on the speed and the size of your blades. And the only thing you have to know in this equation now is this constant. And about the constants we will talk later in this lecture. So this was the start of the lecture where I explained you a little bit about mathematics and how to convert proportionalities into a mathematical language. And the next thing we have to do now is we really have to do a little bit of physics 
So the question we have to answer is, how can we calculate the power of the wind from first principles? To do that, you have to know that air consists of molecules. So air is nothing else than a bulk of molecules which have a certain distance. The distance depends on temperature and density and everything. When there's wind, the air is moving and then each molecule has a certain movement and to a movement there belongs always a kinetic energy. And then the total kinetic energy of the wind is nothing else but the sum of the kinetic energy of all the molecules. How do you now calculate the energy which a molecule has because of its motion? So how do you calculate what is called the kinetic energy? Well, the only thing you have to know is the speed of the molecule and the mass of the molecule. Size, by the way, does not matter in this case. And just for you to understand it better, I have here my tennis ball and the physics behind the kinetic energy of a tennis ball and of a molecule is basically the same in classical physics. That is why physics is so easy because it's so universal. Once you learned it in one corner of the world, you can apply it to another corner of the world. So the kinetic energy of a tennis ball is the larger, the larger the mass is and the bigger the velocity of the ball is. Yeah, I showed you the example. If I throw the ball against myself, I can feel the kinetic energy. And if I take instead of the ball, this heavy stone here, which had one kilogram, then if I throw both of them with the same speed against my head, you can really feel that the big mass has more kinetic energy and that it produces more damage to my head than the light ball here. So it's natural to say that the more mass there is, the more kinetic energy there is. You can even, by just a thought experiment, explain that it is proportional to the mass. You can cut the stone into two halves. And if you throw both halves of the stone against yourself, the total energy is the same as if you have not cut the stone before you throw it. Now the next more important question for us is how does the energy, how does the kinetic energy of an object depend on its velocity? To understand that in a bit more detail, we go back to lecture number 18, where we learned what potential energy is. So we learned that if you carry something up, for example, this stone of one kilogram, uh, it takes work to put it upwards. And you can say that if the stone is up here, it has more energy than if it's down there. So the potential energy with the, which the stone has has been calculated in the last lecture as mass times height times 9.81 joule per newton. If you write that in a formula, you have a potential energy is equal h times m times g. h is the height, m is the mass, and g is this constant, which has to do with the gravity of our Earth which is 9.81. With the new expression of proportionality, you could also say the potential energy is proportional to the height. If you move something up twice as high, you have twice the potential energy. You can also show this nicely in a diagram here. Imagine you have some arbitrary units like meters for the height. You can move something up from zero to one to three to four meters then the potential energy is proportional to that depending on the mass. So if it's about a kilogram, you have 10, 20, 30, 40 joule potential energy. So you see the potential energy follows the height as in a proportional way. What happens now if the stone falls down again? Well, then it loses its potential energy. When it falls down, at the end it has no more potential energy. So while it goes down, it gains motion, it gains speed. And to the speed, we have to assign a kinetic energy because we know in physics there is a conservation law of energy. And therefore, you have to assign a new form of energy when something is moving. And this we call the kinetic energy. And this is shown here as the blue numbers. Why do we know that these numbers go 
proportionally to the height downwards? Well, because the sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy has to be constant. In this case, it's for example 40 Joule. So as long as the stone is moving down, the kinetic energy increases proportionally to the depth which it was falling. So now we know that if something is falling down, the kinetic energy goes proportional to the depth. But what about the speed? If we measure the speed, we find out that the speed is not linear at all. So after one meter of falling, for example, it's something like 4.4 in some units, then it's 6.3, then it's 7.7 .7 and 8.9. So the speed increases because you know when you fall down somewhere, you get faster and faster. But the speed doesn't go linear with the depth, it goes in another way. And if you do this mathematically, what you find is that the kinetic energy goes with the speed to the squared. So you have to square the speed to get the kinetic energy. From mathematics, you can also measure it. You find out that the kinetic energy is always one half times the mass times the speed to the squared. So there's a linear relation between mass and kinetic energy and there's a quadratic dependence between speed and kinetic energy. A quadratic dependence in mathematics is always shown as a parabola and this is nice to know because if you throw a stone, so if I would throw the stone at a certain angle, it makes a parabola. So I can try that with this ball here. So I do it from this side here. So I throw the ball down and you have seen it made a kind of parabola. So the reason for the parabola is the quadratic dependence of the speed and the depth. But to really calculate that you need a bit more mathematics, but it's basically easy to understand. To visualize you the kinetic energy a bit better. I made a, another example here, which to my mind is very important for all of you. So let's take a high building. This is a building in Berlin, which has a lot of floors. Now imagine you take up your car in the lift up to one of the highest floors there, and then you drive out of the window with your car. So what is happening? Well, there are a few interesting things happening. So you should not try that, of course, in your hometown, but you can still learn something from this experiment. So if you move out with your car, it starts to fall. And after the first second, you have a speed of 35.3 kilometers per hour. Then in the next second, you gain again the same amount of speed. So you double the speed, it's 71 kilometers per hour. After the third second of falling, you have 106 kilometers per hour. And after four seconds, you have 140 kilometers per hour. And then you arrive at the floor and probably your car has crashed. So what is the interesting thing about it? Well, every second you gain the same amount of speed. Every second you gain 35.3 kilometers per hour. This has to do with the gravitational force of our Earth. And there's a nice proportionality between the speed and the time of falling. But more important for us is now not the time of falling, but the distance of falling. And there you see after one second you have five meters, after two seconds about 20 meters, after three seconds 44, and after four seconds 78 meters of falling. And there you see that first you have this 5 meters, then you have 4 times as much, which is 20, then you have 9 times as much, which is 44 or 45, and then you have 16 times as much distance, which is 78 meters. So there's again a quadratic dependence, and this time between the time of falling and the distance of falling. Why do I explain this to you? Well, because I think it's important for you if you are driving a car. I don't expect that anybody wants to jump with the car out of a window. But what you learn here is the distance of falling goes quadratically with the time of falling and also quadratically with the speed.
The other thing you learned was that the distance of falling goes linear with the kinetic energy. That's what I showed in the diagram before. So what you can derive from that again is that the kinetic energy goes with the square of the speed. And this is very important for you to know as a car driver because it tells you if you go twice as fast, you have four times the kinetic energy. If you go three times as fast, you have nine times the kinetic energy. And if you go instead of 35, for example, 140, you have four times the speed, but you have 16 times the kinetic energy. So you can imagine if you crash at 140, the damage is basically 16 times as large as you go with small speed. Before you jump out of a window, you have a feeling of, of fear to do that because you know you arrive at very high speed downstairs. But if you drive in your car, you normally don't have this feeling so much. So be aware of that and try to digest that your kinetic energy goes quadratically with the speed. So please don't drive too fast, otherwise it can be fatal. Now we know about the energy of a single object. So let's go back to molecules now. And now assuming that wind is nothing else than a bulk of molecules, you can just count how many molecules are passing the wind power station and then you know how much power there arrives. You count for example for one second and then you have a certain box of molecules which pass through the wind power station in this one second. So then you calculate that this bulk of molecules which pass per second through a wind power station is then proportional to the speed because the faster they move the more molecules go through in a second. And secondly it goes with the size of this bulk of molecules so the number of particles which pass the wind power station is proportional to the product of speed and area. And as you still have in mind, the energy of each molecule is proportional to the square of the velocity. Then of course the total power which the wind has, so the total energy which passes per second, is then naturally the product of V times V squared times A. So it's V to the third power times A. So the power which is in a wind is proportional to the third power of the velocity and proportional to the area of the wind power station. So I hope you understood this context. So if you have three times more wind, you have three times three times three, which is 27 times the wind power compared to before. So now we know how much power a wind has. But the question now is, will the wind power station be able to catch all this power and make electricity out of it? Well, this would be nice if it would be possible, but also for physics reasons, that is unfortunately not possible. And there's a law from Betts which says that as a maximum, about 60% of the power of the wind can be taken by a wind power station. Why is that the case? And this I would like to explain you on the next diagram here. So from the left now we have wind coming to the wind power station at a certain speed. What would happen if the wind power station takes away all the power of the wind? Well, the power of the wind is the motion of the molecules. If the wind turbine now makes electricity out of this kinetic energy, there's no energy left for the wind. So the wind would just pass to the wind power station and then stops there. And if the wind stops there and does not move away anymore, the next wind coming would not have any space there because the wind would stay behind the wind power station, so it would have to go around the wind power station. So in other words, the more efficient a wind power station is, the more wind gets stuck at the wind power station and the new wind coming has to go around the wind power station so that at some point the wind power station would not produce any energy anymore because the wind goes just around it. On the other side, if you do the other extreme, if the wind power station does not reduce the wind speed, then the wind could pass completely through it, but there would not be any 
energy output because if you don't stop the wind you cannot gain any energy. So if you optimize a wind power station on the one hand you have to stop the wind but you should not stop it too much because otherwise the molecules are queuing around the wind power station and the new wind goes around. So there's a compromise between those so that you have to slow down the wind a little bit but not too much and not too little so that you just gain some energy but that there is still enough kinetic energy left in the wind after the wind power station so that it moves away and the new wind can go in. And as I said Beck's law tells you that the optimum is at about 60% and you cannot go higher with such a wind power station. So the final formula for the wind power in a wind power station is that it has to be below 0.6 times and then we have the proportionality V to the third power and A. And if you do the right proportionality constants from which you have to derive from basic physics, you find out that the missing constant is just one half times rho. And rho is the density of the air depending on the humidity and the air pressure and so on. So this is the final law which gives you the limit for the wind power which is possible and then you have to optimize as an engineer the wind power station so that you get as close as possible to this value of 60% efficiency. So this is now enough about the physics of the wind and now I would like to explain you a few more things about the technology of wind power station. So modern wind power stations typically have three blades and they are quite big. They are available with multi megawatt power. So like four megawatt is no problem nowadays if they are high enough and big enough. Modern wind power station can run with variable speed depending on the wind speed. They can also have faster or slower rotation and still the generator works properly. They don't need gearboxes nowadays anymore because they have electrical generators inside where the frequency they produce depend on the rotational speed but this frequency can then be adjusted electronically so that it fits to the power grid they are using. Then you can nowadays have a pitch in the blades so you can adjust the orientation of the blades as shown in the picture here and that also is there to optimize your wind power efficiency according to the wind speed which you have at a certain time. And then of course all of them need some brakes because if there's a big storm the power would be so immense that the generator would burn down or that the rotation would be so fast that the blades would flow away just from the centrifugal forces. Therefore, of course, you need the brakes to stop the wind power station when there's a storm. There are all kinds of variations of wind power stations. For example, this one here is open for visitors. So you can go up inside and uh, have a nice look down. Not everybody likes that because it's quite high. Then, of course, there are not only these huge wind power stations, but you can also build small wind power stations. Here are two examples from the Antarctis. Why do you need wind power stations at the Antarctis? Well, you cannot work with solar power normally because at least half of the year there's no sun in this area. So it's too bad if you are in the winter at an Antarctis station and you have no sun and no power. But wind power you have all the year. Either you use a small wind power station with the three blades this is the optimal way to do it. But there are also other designs. Very nice are the designs which have a vertical axis. This has the advantage that it doesn't matter from where the wind comes, it always works. So you don't have to adjust the axis of the wind power station. It just works for any direction. The disadvantage of the vertical direction is that these wind power stations typically have less efficiency. So they cannot produce as much power as a wind power station with the horizontal axis, which has the same area as the one with the vertical axis. Another advantage of the vertical axis is that there are less vibrations. So that is the reason why you can put a wind power station with a vertical axis easily on the top of a house on the roof. 
and engineers invented a lot of variations of wind power stations which have different concepts and different principles and they all have different costs and different efficiencies and then for your own application you have then to decide yourself what you would like to have. There's also a nice idea to have this vertical axis wind power station on top of a light pole because you have already the cabling at this position and you could just add wind power stations to every light pole if you want that and if you are in an area where there's enough wind for that. Another concept here has counter rotating turbines. This increases the efficiency of your wind power station but of course it costs also more material. You can still live with one generator but you have a different technology and then you have to design if it's worth the additional cost to get a bit more out of the wind power station. There are more unusual concepts to make use of wind power. One is using kites. So you let a kite go up to high heights. At high heights you have a lot of wind and you can use the forces of these kites to produce energy. There are all kind of concepts to do that. But unfortunately there is not yet a stable concept which is conversionally applicable. Another nice idea is to harvest wind power on a boat. There are all kind of funny things you can do with wind on boats. For example, there are these rotator ships, which you see here on the picture. This has nothing to do with the use of wind power. It's basically the opposite of producing wind power. What they do here is they rotate the cylinder and according to the Magnus effect, which some of you might know, which is a bit complicated to explain in physics, according to the Magnus effect then there is a force on the cylinder which pushes the boat forward. So you replace a propeller in a boat by these two cylinders. So this is not harvesting wind power, but of course you could in addition have a wind power station, for example one with a vertical axis. And then you could use the wind power station with the vertical axis to produce electricity and the electricity then could rotate your cylinders and push your boat forward. But now let's come to the idea of an energy harvesting ship. So there the idea is that the ship always goes to region where there is quite a lot of wind and then they produce a lot of energy in this area. And what do they do with the air energy? Well, so they don't have a cable to put it to the grid, but they could produce, for example, hydrogen from it. So the idea would be that these boats were, for example, going around the Atlantic, always into areas where there's a lot of wind. They produce hydrogen there, and then the hydrogen they bring on land, and then they sell the hydrogen, and then they go back again and harvest some more wind power. But these are only ideas. At the moment this is also not commercially applied. What is however applied is offshore wind power. So you see for example here a wind park with a lot of wind power station. Each of them has for example 5 megawatt. It's big wind power turbines and when the wind is blowing strongly they can continue more or less continuously produce offshore wind with it. These wind power stations are grounded, so you can do that only close to the shore or in an area where the sea is not so deep. And then of course you need a cable to get rid of the electricity. And this is normally done by having another platform with a transformer, which transforms the wind from all the wind power stations on one cable to the shore. In modern stations, you don't use AC alternating current but DC direct current. So you need a transformer station which converts the AC which comes from the wind power stations into DC and then the DC goes by cable to the shore. The big advantage of DC for undersea cable is that there are much less losses. Yeah, and AC cables have big losses, especially in sea cables. For the grounding of these power stations there are different concepts. One possibility is to use these huge tripods here where you put the wind power station on top. A new idea which is quite promising is that you have 
swimming offshore wind power stations. So you don't have to fix them in the ground anymore. You have this swimming machines. The one on the right has three swimming legs. The one on the left has one swimming leg plus there's a platform just for operation. This is a prototype and the big advantage of course is that you can do those kind of things also when the sea is quite deep. So not only close to the coast. So if you do that at larger scale, you will have wind parks on sea, like the one you see here in the picture. The more wind power stations you have, the more power you get, of course. If wind comes to the first row of wind turbines, its speed is a bit reduced because the power is taken out of the wind so that the wind power stations behind see a little bit less wind. Of course, the wind typically comes at an angle to these power stations and it takes only a small fraction out of the total wind power. But still there are effects and people have calculated that by changing the rotational speed of your wind turbines, you can gain, you can optimize the total amount of wind power. So for example, what they found out by calculation is if the first turbines rotate a little bit slower and produce less wind power, then the total amount of wind power taken out of the whole wind park can be bigger as if the first ones take already most of the wind out. But these are details. This is interesting for physicists to do the calculations and to do simulations. And all in all, I would say wind power is a big field and we still need a lot of inventive power by engineers and physicists and also mathematicians to optimize wind power stations and to get more out of our wind, which the sun gives us for free. This is already the end of this lecture today. Thank you for listening and next time we will talk about solar power and solar power is the biggest renewable power which is available on our globe thanks to our sun. Goodbye. See you next time. Thank you.